Transylvanian Sunrise by Radu Sinemar with Peter Moon I was quickly drawn into the subject of our talk so that it was only after a few minutes that I realized the driver had already started the engine and was driving silently to an unknown destination without my or Cesar's asking him to do that. Once in front of the Sofitel Hotel where Cesar had booked a room, I expressed my bewilderment at the driver's action who had been given no instructions. While we were heading to his room, Cesar told me that, in some cases, words proved to be useless and the mental function, when well controlled and purged of external interference, could operate as efficiently as words. In other words, he was summarizing for me the principles of telepathy. I thought he was kidding me at first, but immediately afterwards, he told me how he had done it, at the very moment he was saying hello and sitting himself beside me in the car, he sent the driver the mental instructions for starting the engine and heading to a particular destination. Convinced that he had heard the verbal instruction, the driver acted accordingly. When training in this direction is intensive and persevering, the telepathic transmission of thoughts is no longer a problem, Cesar said with a slight smile. After we entered his room, he made a drawing on a piece of paper. At the same time, he gave me the requisite explanations as follows. Suppose individual A is part of a community of individuals. His thoughts, which are not strong, mix up with other people's thoughts resulting in a mental fog of sorts since those thoughts are usually weak, unclear, and poorly defined. They are only fragments of superficial, half-baked ideas. One can then say that each of those individuals lives in relative isolation, in a mental world of their own. Somehow, they are influenced, to a greater or lesser extent, by the receptiveness of the individual in question and with the thoughts of those around. Most often, they perceive these outside influences unconsciously, like mere changes in dispositions or inner states of mind. That is why I have used the term mental fog, because people can't see each other at this level, much like a vessel at sea left without a rudder in foggy weather. Cesar stood silent for a while, making yet another draw ing. But if an individual sends a very concentrated thought, that thought will perfectly resemble a focused light beam, like a laser, he added. Moreover, if that individual directs his mental beam with much precision to another individual B, then the latter will perceive and mentally see that beam like a strong light through the fog around, like the beams of a lighthouse or a strong light guiding vessels to the shore. The process is therefore simple, but it takes diligent training. But what do you mean by mental purging? I asked with an innocence that was much warranted by the sheer novel nature of the explanations he was giving. In reality, Cesar explained willingly, what we call mental or the mind is a very complex and subtle fabric serving many functions and being structured into various energetic vibration frequencies. Some call these frequency bands abilities or powers. That's why achievements are not the same everywhere as not all people have the same powers. For instance, individual A can easily focus when learn ING, individual B can contain emotions well, individual C has a better memory than other people, but all this is only a minute share of the potential available to us. Even so, they become manifest in the surrounding mental mediocrity but are not yet refined or trained adequately. By employing certain training methods, the mental abilities of human beings can be very much developed which will later make them act highly efficiently. That is what I call purging, since, metaphorically speaking, the mind sheds the layer of secondary thoughts often corrupted by mean intentions which are either empty in terms of real content or weak and powerless. Those who can thus purge their mind can acquire extraordinary mental power. Their mind can then easily pierce the mental fog of the masses, much like an arrow cutting through smoke. It is only from that level upwards that people learn, and at the same time experience, the fact that the mind, as a subtle form of energy, is superior to matter which it can consequently subdue and control. This is how paranormal powers emerge. These, however, also require a high degree of individual awareness because responsibilities are then huge. Supernatural powers may trigger selfish and arrogant actions in individuals that can complicate their destiny a great deal. Much like when one throws a ball at a wall, 
the ball strikes back with the same force. One must therefore act maturely and discerningly to the benefit of those around and not to one's own interest only. Unfortunately, some people develop such powers to serve selfish, individual or small group interests. In some Cases, the problem becomes even more serious when the aim is to influence the masses with a view to getting power and absolute control over them. This is the reason I wanted to meet with you. I want to disclose these truths and you can help with making them public. I was utterly amazed at his words. In the space of only a few tens of minutes, I had been confronted with ideas and notions I did not even imagine existed. A part of me was outraged telling me I was definitely the target of a bunch of lies or mockery. The entire scenario was somewhat phantasmagorical, too fast, too much, too unexpected. Despite all that, the prevailing impulse was to fully trust Cesar Brad and even offer to cooperate unconditionally. My suspicions, all too natural given the circumstances, could not gain ground to the deep feeling that what I was doing was good and noble. The man in front of me inspired mysterious confidence and inner peace which chased out almost any urge my normal reasoning might have had to digress or protest, thus opening up to me the path to a mysterious realm that was holding me spellbound. Cesar did not want to waste any minute on useless talks or complex and long-drawn-out introductions. He was thus giving me the clear impression of a man who would not budge in his determination, getting straight to the point with no beating about the bush or unnecessary delays. In spite of all this, not for one single moment did I have the feeling of any obligation or pressure for accept ing his proposal. That was of paramount importance to me. Among others, Cesar Brad had the amazing ability to instill gushing enthusiasm for one particular issue and effortlessly capture people's attention and interest, but this was a manifestly spontaneous and perfectly natural influence on his part. It was his very subtle radiance that filled souls in a very pleasant manner. I can hardly wait to describe the amazing events that followed, but still, my mission must be gradual or else the risk is that I give rise to suspicions in the reader's mind confronting them with a skein of events described in an unformed manner. I shall therefore come back to the chronological description of the principal events in Cesar Brad's life so that the reader can understand as best as possible the way in which he unraveled the wheeling and dealing and the aims and means of some occult individuals and organizations who operate at global level and have stealthily cast their net to include Romania. As one will gather from the pages to follow, this was to lead to a spectacular change in the situation, the main character of which was Cesar himself. As I have already said, the climax was the amazing discovery in the Busigi Mountains in which several states and regions of the globe are involved at present, with the American state and diplomacy in the lead. My knowledge of this subject prompts me to say that immediately after the great discovery in the mountains in 2003, diplomatic relations between Romania and the United States of America became very complex and their balance was quite fragile. This situation was due to tensions triggered by conflicting intentions in the wake of the extraordinary discovery. Among others, those intentions targeted the very condition of the human race. In the months that followed that watershed event, Ten Shaun was diffused with a joint action plan devised at the highest level diplomatic levels of the two states. I shall describe the corresponding arrangements at the right time. For the moment, I shall only say that the understanding between Romania and the USA was not convenient to certain political forces in our country whose visions were much more progressive. This gave rise to further tension and even triggered a change of opinion across the Romanian political spectrum. Last-minute information that reached me right before this book went to print confirmed a future meeting I shall have with Cesar Brad, almost one year after our last meeting, where I shall learn about other fulminating and confidential aspects relating to the Great Expedition, Cesar conducted with a joint Romanian-American team, starting from the reality of the discovery in the Busigi Mountains. Although I am already in possession of the main data on the expedition, I would rather not anticipate but describe everything in a coherent manner and in detail after I get hold of further precious information. I consider this step to be necessary, particularly in view of the fact that people have a right to know the historical truth as well as who wanted to manipulate this truth for decades and for what reason. This is the thread of the story in this book. 
whether it will resound with the consciousness of the people or, on the contrary, will be met with irony and distrust. I am nevertheless of the firm belief that the commitment to writing and publishing this book is a profoundly beneficial and positive one as it will at least give rise to certain questions in people's minds and stir up interest in the occult and subtle dimensions of self-knowledge. When seven years of age, Cesar was put in school but he excelled at no subject. He was a normal student of average performance. Nothing betrayed any of his preoccupations and thoughts and his grades were more a reflection of what he heard and understood in the classroom as he l. Most never studied at home. However, when Cesar was in the third grade, his teacher, who was deeply troubled and puzzled, called his parents to school. She wanted to know whether they had noticed anything unusual in the boy's behavior, but both Nikolai and Smiranda Brad firmly denied as they had been instructed to do by the representatives of the security. The teacher then told them what had happened. As she had some papers to grade, she instructed her students to learn by heart a poem of a few stanzas she had read out loud beforehand at the front of the classroom. Shortly after that, she was surprised to find that Cesar was looking absent-mindedly out of the window while everybody else was learning the poem. She told him to mind the poem but after a few minutes, she found him doing the same. Cesar, stand up, she yelled at the child. Why aren't you learning the poem as everybody else? The boy, retaining his calm and composure, did not seem to be at all intimidated by the threatening tone of his teacher's voice. But I know it already, he came back in a low voice. What do you mean you already know it? Why are you lying to me? I'm not lying. I heard it when you read it out loud for us, he replied. Mad at the child's bravery but also curious about the truth, the teacher asked him to say the poem in front of the classroom. Cesar repeated the entire poem without a flaw. I thought he had learned it beforehand at home. But that was a new lesson, and as you well know, he doesn't go overboard about learning, the woman continued to explain excitedly. Then I asked him to say two more poems just as long as the first one, which were not in the handbook but which I read for him only once. After listening carefully, he repeated them both without mistake or any break. That is why I wanted to see you and talk to you, because I have never seen anything like this before. Shortly after, however, the incident was forgotten. Cesar told me he was quick to realize the use of making himself inconspicuous when in the company of other people as that was a good way of avoiding harassment, curiosity, or even meanness and envy, especially on the part of his friends. Even at that early age, I felt it was very important not to draw attention upon myself. There were plenty of other more important things that required my full attention and interest when I was back at home in my room, he told me with an enigmatic smile. He was, of course, speaking about his mysterious subtle experiences that he had when sinking deep within himself, far away from outside influence. His parents had long ago given up troubling him with questions about his attitude. That had grown to be a normal attitude as had the monthly reports and the visits they got from the securitate upon no prior notice. Until he turned ten, those around him had only one occasion to look upon Cesar as upon a strange human being. That was when he gave his aunt, then visiting the Brads, a special warning. Cesar was unaware of his aunt's arrival, but when he came in and laid eyes upon her, he stood transfixed as if looking through the body of the woman in front of him. Everyone had noticed something was wrong and asked him what the matter was or whether he felt all right, but the boy gave no reply and headed to his room instead. It was only in the early hours of the evening, troubled and anxious, that he asked his aunt when she would go back home to Bucharest. Upon learning she had bought a train ticket for the next day, he seemed to quiet down a little. Still, he asked her not to travel by car, a piece of advice everybody present chose to disregard. Emilia, Cesar's aunt, was to leave for Bucharest the following day with her brother, Nikolai Brad, to settle some family problems. Paradoxically, they did not wake up in time to catch the next morning's train since the clock had broken and failed to sound the alarm. Emilia's presence in Bucharest was badly needed that morning so she got a lift and took the last free seat in a car. Cesar's father came back home and was to leave for the capital on the next train. The terrible news came shortly before his departure to the railway station. 
The driver who had given Amelia a lift had been involved in a serious accident in the neighborhood of Bucharest. Of all the occupants, it was only Amelia who died, the others having been wounded but were safe. Smiranda Brad was the only one to remember Cesar's odd behavior as well as the advice he had given Aunt Amelia. She wrote that down in the monthly report, but even that notable incident faded in significance in the face of the huge surprise she experienced shortly afterwards. This was an event that would take Cesar away from his family for good.